Thanks a bunch for coming today. My name is Velcro Ripper, and I'm a <clears throat> filmmaker and uh, director. And we have joining us on this panel, which is called Before and Beyond Broadcast, um, three um, wonderful distributors. We have uh, Ollie Harbottle, who is from Dog Woo Films, and they're, uh, they're a companion initiative, which is called um, Good With Films. Right? Yeah. And we have uh, Jeff Deutschman from uh, IFC uh, Films, and Deborah Zimmerman from Women Make Movies. So I thought we could begin by just um, each of us going across and, and saying a little bit about your company, who you are, and, uh, and what, your, what your work is in the company, and what the company does. Do you want to start on? OK. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm Oli Harbottle. I'm head of distribution at Dogworth. Uh, Dogworth was set up six, seven years ago as a, as a traditional independent distributor doing art house films, foreign language independent. And then we stumbled across a wonderful film called Black Gold back in 2007, uh, which was a documentary about fair trade focusing on a, the Ethiopian coffee uh, industry. And um, we had a huge success with that film, and it kind of opened up our eyes in terms of a business that no one was really putting out these films in the cinemas, and documentaries were kind of relegated to, to television, unless they were Morgan Spurlock or, or Michael Moore. And we found out there was a real audience for these kind of films. And as well as the audience, there was kind of the, the opportunity to work with big organizations, both NGOs and brands, etc. And we decided on the back of that to really focus on these kind of films. And we've kind of aggressively kind of dominated that sector of the market ever since. Um, we've had some huge successes with films like The Age of Stupid, The End of the Line, and recently Restrepo. Um, and... Um, yeah, now we specialize in these kind of social issue documentaries. We release 16 theatrically each year. We do the same again straight to home entertainment and to non-theatrical. And we're always looking to innovate. A lot of our marketing is online. 90% um, of our resources, both financial and in terms of manpower, is kind of dedicated to online marketing and looking to kind of really challenge the traditional windows, um, getting films out as widely and as quickly as possible um, across all different platforms. Uh, I'm Jeff Deutschman. I do acquisitions for IFC Films um, slash Sundance Selects, which is a new distribution label of ours. Um, we are the uh, all rights distributor uh, attached to IFC, the channel. So it's, a, it's actually separate from the, 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 the linear network. Um, we acquire all rights to feature films, both documentaries and narrative films. Um, and what we're known for doing is releasing them day and date, theatrically and on VOD. Um, that's cable video on demand in the US. But we've actually been experimenting and doing uh, a few different sort of windowing strategies for our films recently that I can talk about um, a little bit later on, maybe. Hi, I'm Debbie Zimmerman from Women Make Movies, and again, I'm sorry I'm late. I had a little technological snafu. My Mac, which syncs with my PC in the office, which syncs with my iPhone and my Blackberry, deleted my calendar on my iPhone. <laughs> so, um, again, I apologize. Um, Women Make Movies is somewhat of an amalgam of what both these guys are talking about, um, but actually quite uh, unique and different from probably every other distributor, um, in that we focus very specifically on subject, on films that are both by and about women. Uh, that's in our distribution program. We also have a production assistance program, which helps women, almost 200 women actually, in our program at any given time in various stages of production, which I can talk about more if anybody's interested in. But in terms of us being a distributor, we've actually been around for almost 40 years, distributing for 30 years, and have gone through just about every... Uh, format change from 35 to 16 to beta to three-quarter inch and back to digibeta and VHS and digital formats now. Um, we create very uh, individual distribution strategies for every film that we distribute. I'm totally impressed that Dog Wolf can do 16 theatrical releases in a year as well as 16 non-theatrical and straight to DVD. We can't possibly do that. Um, and we actually decided not to focus on theatrical distribution because we felt that we could really only do four or five of them a year uh, really solidly. Um, so we acquire 
uh, about 20 to perhaps maybe uh, 25 uh, films that are everything from feature documentaries to short films, uh, including films of up to 20 minutes. Um, we're probably most known as the, here in England as the distributor of uh, Kim Longinato's films. Um, and as I said, every film that we distribute, we create a different kind of strategy for. We've actually been doing the kind of outreach that everybody's talking about for the last 30 years because our background really is in uh, grassroots and educational distribution and reaching audiences, very, very diverse audiences for very, very long periods of time. We actually have films in distribution for actually 30 years. Um, so for some films, we'll start with a, a theatrical release, a very limited art house uh, release. Uh, for other films, we'll start with the broadcast. For other films, they may never be broadcast and we'll actually start with and just focus on educational distribution and grassroots outreach. And then some films end up in, in digital distribution, pre predominantly on, on iTunes. Um, and, yeah. Great, wonderful. So I'd like to work our way through some of the questions posed in, the, in this uh, panel description. So the, the, one of the first questions up is, how is the new multi-platform mediascape affecting our reach? So how, how is, are the new tools that are available um, be, becoming implemented um, by distributors? So why don't we work our way through the panel again and sort of explore that question perhaps with some examples. Um, Ollie, for example, I know Good With Films is, a, is, a, is using the internet as a, as a way of um, organizing with your ambassadors and, and collecting um, grassroots <coughs> support. Yeah, uh, Good With Film is very much a, a new dog with initiative and um, we're still kind of learning what, what it will become. But what we're finding with all our films is that there's very much dedicated audiences for each of the social issues um, pertaining to each film. So it might be environmentally uh, aware people, or it might be human rights. And Good With Film is really a, a drive on our part to kind of bring all these people together because we're finding we have massive communities for each film, and you can see them in clear numbers on Facebook and on newsletters, etc. But once that film has kind of had its life, we, we don't want to kind of lo lose that audience. So Good With Film is really a hub to bring all those people together. Um, and out, out, of, out of it has um, sprung our Ambassadors Program, which is really um, something quite different. I mean, it's, it's the traditional non-theatrical screenings, but uh, traditionally in, in distribution, um, if people want to hold a screening, kind of a film society or a, a non-cinema, they usually have to wait between 8 and 16 weeks till after the cinema release. Um, but for us, that makes absolutely no sense because we have this audience out there uh, they want to show our films, and we're identifying these people who are becoming dog with ambassadors. And what we're allowing them to do is to hold their own screenings of the film exactly day and date with the cinema release, which means that they get the benefits of our national PR campaign, our national marketing campaign. Um, but they get, the, they get that benefit, but then using their local knowledge of their audience and their community, they can hold their screening at the same time. Um, we launched this initiative with Restrepo last year. We had about 30 ambassadors, worked a lot with lots of soldiers' charities, and um, we're doing it for our release of Countdown to Zero um, on the 21st of June. Uh, we're doing a live simulcast premiere from BAFTA, uh, where the film will be followed by a discussion panel with people like the Queen of Jordan and Lawrence Bender. And um, this will be broadcast to 45 cinemas nationwide, but we're also doing a web stream so that these ambassadors around the country can also do the same event. Um, and we've got about 30 on board. And how, how, is, the, how is the response, and what are, what are, what are the, some of the challenges you're facing with that program? Um, everyone loves it, to be honest. I mean, it, it's, it's, no one else is doing it. Um, what we're finding is that cinemas, I mean, it's very hard to get these documentaries into cinemas. If they do put on these films, it's often for one day, maybe a few days. Um, and also, a lot of these areas aren't serviced by cinemas. The, the people in rural areas where there are no cinemas, so it it's really is working, um, and um, there aren't too many challenges. Mm -hmm. Great, wonderful. Okay, we'll probably come back to some more questions around that. So, mm -hmm. um, Jeff, I know you guys have a unique day and date release concept, which I think would be great to talk about with IFC. Yeah, it's similar to what Ali was talking about. Um, about five years ago, we we're one of the pioneers of this strategy whereby um, we essentially collapsed the, win the theatrical and VOD window. Um, because we're, we are owned by Cablevision, we had sort of a unique access to a lot of the cable VOD real estate. 
and um, uh, were able to start offering films on cable on demand um, for a higher price point than they would normally be available for uh, because we market them to the consumer as being simultaneously in theaters. And the idea behind it is that for most independent films, you're you know lucky to co go to the theaters in a handful of the, m the biggest cities in the country um, anyway. So in order to, you know, fully, what VOD does is it allows you to more fully penetrate areas of the country that don't necessarily even have art, art houses um, and for a much lower cost than it would be involved in sort of making prints and buying ads in, in all of those markets. So that's what we started to do. We, and we've had a lot of success doing that, releasing um, a wide variety of films that way from you know, British films like In the Loop, um, to uh, American indie films by Joe Swanberg, to documentaries um, like uh, we did um, Joe Strummer, The Future is Unwritten a few years back. We currently have um, uh, the Herzog 3D film Cave of Forgotten Dreams out, mm. um, which is doing great. The, the difference now is that in the last year or so, we've actually begun to experiment experiment with the traditional model and actually go back to releasing certain films um, just theatrically before they go to VOD. That's what we've done with the Herzog film. Um, we did it with Joan Rivers, A Piece of Work, last summer. We're going to be doing it again with uh, Tabloid, the Errol Morris film, next month, and with Buck coming out in a week. <coughs> Interestingly, we found that this strategy works better in some cases for primarily documentaries. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of that has to do with sort of the fact that, that the films that do well on VOD oftentimes are doing well because they have some inherent ancillary value, whether it's a star or a certain genre, um, whereas docs tend to benefit from the kind of um, marketing and publicity that are usually associated with theatrical releases. One, one argument would be that to have both of those revenue streams happening at the same time, you know, the theatrical publicity crosses over to the VOD, and that has often been the case. But sometimes you have to create that value first, thereby, you know, creating the value of the film that then can, ha it'll, it'll have more value for VOD later in certain in certain circumstances. So that's one of the sort of issues that we're grappling with on a film by film basis, just really, as Debbie said, sort of catering the strategy to, to the film. Um, and, you know, I think cable VOD is our primary area of, of uh, sort of new distribution platform that we've been working with, but we also do a lot of digital VOD as well. But generally speaking, we do that in a later window. We have, you know, deals with Netflix and iTunes and Amazon and Sony and Xbox and all those places. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess I feel like, in answer to your question, a lot of this stuff, a lot of the changes that are going on ha just simply have to do with the technology that's available and the patterns of the way that consumers are consuming movies. But in terms of marketing, I feel like things are not changing all that much and sort of, you know, the fact that you can bring a film to VOD doesn't mean you don't have to do the work to get people to see the movie. It's still, it's, it's not sort of this magical catch-all. Films still either will work or they won't. Mm -hmm. I guess one of, the, one of the innovations that we have now is social media, which hasn't really been, had the full force of its strength until the last couple of years. Deborah, is that something that is, your filmmakers are working with, and do you, and do you integrate with the social media campaigns? Of oh, yeah, hu hugely. I mean, the internet has been just as a whole, and, frank, and actually I don't really see, I don't know actually if social media is that much of, uh, if it's really all that different mm -hmm. than being a, just a different mechanism, you know? And uh, maybe it's because we've been working with films that never had theatrical release, you know, so that it's always been this very kind of like viral grassrootsy, word-of-mouth kind of thing. And it's a tremendous asset. I mean, it's it's fantastic in, in every way, shape, and form. And, and as with Dogwood, 90% of what we do is online in terms of marketing. I don't think... I mean, we actually still do print 
a new releases catalog that we send out 50,000 of them to um, universities and nonprofit organizations and government agencies and prisons and police stations and hospitals and all those kinds of places that use films in, in their um, in their educational work and and we still need to do that I mean you still need to I think the other problem just across the board is that there's so much information coming at people now, so much more information, that they have to see it so many more times before it actually sinks in. Mm. So we need all of these different strategies in order to really make an impact um, and to compete against these huge films. And I think that, you know, particularly for documentaries, there's a handful of films that, that really reach this kind of, kind of mass appeal audience. And it's really interesting to me to hear what Jeff was saying about... Um, going back to the traditional model for documentaries in that kind of slow build because um, that's kind of what we do but for different reasons because, you know, for us, we don't really acquire films that we think the primary audience is going to be consumer. Um, we're really interested in very in-depth educational distribution as our back end, meaning that we're selling DVDs for very high cost to institutions that use them over and over and over again for many, many, many years, and thousands of students see it. And it is very much focused on a group students, but we like that because we think that at college age, people actually are very open, <clears throat> and you can really influence them. And uh, most of the films that, that we distribute really are about some sort of social issue in some way, and they're all feminist. They're all trying to make a change in the way that people think. So we're really interested in kind of doing it in a very, very strategic kind of way. Um, but all of these tools are, are really fantastic, fantastic opportunities. Um, and I also, I also agree with what Jeff was saying about, about marketing. U ultimately, it doesn't matter what delivery system you're using, whether it's VOD, whether it's uh, DVD, whether it's in a theater. It's all about marketing, and it's all about the time and energy that you put in and the strategies that you put in to films getting seen. Um, and somebody's got to do it. Either it's going to be filmmakers doing it for themselves and, and maybe splitting all their rights and giving this piece to this person and that person and working with all these different distributors, or it's going to be one distributor that's going to be putting all that, that effort in and taking a bigger percentage of the royalty. But somebody's got to do the work. Um, and I think we're all about trying to find the, the, the most efficient ways of doing that work in terms of getting the word out and finding the biggest possible audience or the, the most uh, revenue-generating audience. Mm -hmm. That's great. You've brought up a couple of points I wanted to touch on. One is the, the role of the filmmaker in working with the distributor. Mm -hmm. And maybe, um, Ollie, you could talk a bit about that with, uh, with your releases that are coming up. For example, Countdown to Zero. How involved is the filmmaker and how involved do you want the filmmaker to be? Um, I mean, I think Dogworth is kind of known for working incredibly closely with, with our filmmakers. Um, and that can be displayed either in the types of deal we do. We, uh, we sometimes do service deals where we're not actually acquiring the rights. We're just fulfilling mm -hmm. and doing all the work that Deborah was just alluding to. Um, but even even where it's a traditional distribution deal, um, we, we, we love working with our filmmakers. And when you specialize in social issue documentaries, you kind of need their expertise, their knowledge. Mm -hmm. A lot of these filmmakers have done a lot of groundwork talking to their NGOs, talking to the relevant organizations for research for their films. So to not work with them would, would just be um, counterproductive. So um, for Countdown to Zero, Lucy Walker, she's kind of a very um, high-profile filmmaker at the moment. She just did Wasteland, and she's kind of the darling of the British media. So we've been working very closely with her and also the producers. Um, Lawrence Bender, who also produced An Inconvenient Truth, uh, he's been incredibly supportive, helping us um, talk to all the relevant people. He's going to come over for the premiere. Um, but yeah, we pride ourselves on working with our filmmakers because I think particular to these films, the, the expertise and the research they've had to do to make the films is, is an incredible useful asset for us. Hmm. And, and for you, Jeff, what, what do you see as the role of the filmmaker in, in the release and the ongoing campaign? I mean, I completely agree. It, it's, it's a very collaborative process with us as well. Um, I guess the one thing I would say is that is maybe you're maybe you're I don't know if this is what you're getting at, but is that in so, there there has been a lot of talk about whether filmmakers need. To, I mean, it's always been collaborative in independent film, but perhaps now with uh, depending on what size film you're making, 
in a lot of cases, filmmakers have had to take an even greater step and sort of distribute films themselves and, and um, you know, and actually sort of become, um, you know, there's this argument that the distribution side is part of the filmmaking process now as, you know, as a filmmaker you need to, and I, I think that it, it really depends on what kinds of movies you're making. But if you're working with us, then I wouldn't go quite that far. You know, there's an expertise that we're bringing to the table, and you know, to a certain degree, we want our filmmakers to be filmmakers and you know make their next movie. But absolutely, it's it's a very collaborative process, and and um, you know, whether it's just it's a, it's publicity is very important for us because we you know a lot of our philosophy is is not to do expensive marketing campaigns. And so a lot of what we do is, is review-driven and publicity-driven, and so the, the filmmakers become implemental to that. Yeah, I, I find myself, I, I anticipate devoting a, almost a good year to, to a release of a feature doc. Like, I, I, as a filmmaker, I commit myself for about a year to, you know, being available and working hard, actually. Um, what, now, you're an all-rights distributor. Are you an exclusive? Do you generally do all-rights? Can you explain right. what an all-rights distributor is and what that means? Right, so um, when we acquire a film, we'll acquire all the rights, you know, theatrical rights, VOD, DVD, television, um, and we have the ability to exploit films across all of those platforms. Um, as opposed to, there are certain companies that only focus on one set of rights, um, and then the filmmaker, as Debbie alluded to, can sort of split the rights and sell their TV rights to, say, PBS, and then sell their DVD rights to, you know, new video, and then sell theatrical rights to Debbie. No. Or, no? To no. someone. Not to us, but to someone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know who. I mean, that's, I think, that's one of the tricky things about it. Who's going to do the theatrical without having any of the rights? Right. So, right. Well, know? it's, it's, it's then hard. It's usually a service deal because the filmmaker has to pay for it. Because, if you don't mind me jumping in, mm -hmm. that's part of the problem. You know, all rights deals usually are based on, you know, nobody makes money theatrically. That's always been the way that it is in the business. It's mm -hmm. really a way of creating buzz for the film to make money in other markets. So... That's why we would never take a film just the theatrical rights because we're going to spend all the money and how are we going to make the money? Um, we've got to make the money on educational sales. Other distributors have to make the money on uh, DVD rights or on sometimes on broadcast. Right. So that's where it gets really tricky. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. And so do you, do you, are you also an all rights distributor? Yeah, yeah, we are. But what we'll do is, which again, we're very different. I mean, I was just meeting with filmmakers who were doing a deal with ITVS. We don't require the broadcast rights. Uh -huh. We will start with that film. And, and we do work incredibly closely with our filmmakers. You know, let me just step back for one second. You know, I've been doing this for a really, really long time. And one of the things I've said to filmmakers, I do distribution workshops to help them to understand how distribution works because it's so important and it's what you don't learn in film school, um, is that there are three things that you can get out of distribution. And if you're really lucky and you have Dog Wolf as your distributor, maybe you get all three, which is great. Um, but not all filmmakers are going to have that, that ability. Uh, and the three things are fame, fortune, and a good conscience. Um, and you really have to be clear you know, about what it is that you're looking for. And in some, sometimes one of those is much better for a filmmaker than another. You know? And I mean fame, I'm not talking about getting to be super duper famous, but you know, there are films that kind of break through, or not even break through, but build the career of a filmmaker. We work with filmmakers that are just out of the box, first time filmmakers, have never had a film on the festival scene, have never had a film kind of be a success. And for them, it's about getting their film in front of the kinds of people that are going to help them to get their next deal. You know, whether that's a broadcast deal, or whether it's a theatrical deal, or whether it's whatever it is. We were the first ones to distribute Jane Campion's films and Sally Potter's films and, and other filmmakers who went on to then work in Hollywood and become very big filmmakers. And we're happy about that. You know, for others, it is about paying back their debt. It's about making money. And in that case, 
you know, maybe you're not going to, it's not about film festivals, it's not about kind of what I call, in some cases, vanity exhibition. It's about going straight to wherever the money is for that particular film, whether it's DVD or whether it's, in our case, educational distribution um, or a big broadcast sale. And the broadcaster, and that's an, this is another issue, how many rights broadcasters are taking. This is a huge mm-hmm. issue. You know, a broadcaster is going to take all your rights, but they're going to pay you lots of money, and you're going to get exposure on television, and that's great. And the third thing is a good conscience. And in some cases, you know, it is really about getting that film to a very, very particular audience that has nothing to do with film festival. Or it can, but it doesn't have to, you know. Mm-hmm. The other thing I just say to filmmakers is if you want to make a film that's really, really needed, you know, then you can get a lot of mileage out of that film. When, and it's not going to be all that different. But if you're going to make a film that is about a subject that you're passionate about that maybe isn't so needed, and I'll give you a great example of this, Kim Longinato's film, Sisters-in-Law, is about two women judges in the Cameroon. Who the hell cares about the Cameroon? Nobody cares about the Cameroon. Nobody cares about women judges. Nobody even knows where the Cameroon is. But she made an extraordinarily beautiful, brilliant film that we were able to get out to all kinds of platforms and all kinds of audiences because she made it really brilliantly and because we were extremely strategic in the way that we handled it. So there's really different things going on with all kinds of, of different films. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that even answered the question, but yeah, no, maybe it was useful. Yeah, that's great. And so, Ollie, are you also looking for all rights? <clears throat> um, we're very flexible with our deals. Uh, in, the, in the UK, a lot of documentaries are commissioned by either the BBC or, or by True Stories or More Force. So we often find that the films we're picking up already have TV locked in. Um, ideally, we'd like all rights because, it, I mean, it's just better for us, better for the business, I guess. But we're very open. Sometimes we just take DVD and iTunes. Sometimes we just service a theatrical. Sometimes we just do non-theatrical via our ambassadors, etc. Um, so we're very open to all sorts of deals, and I think that's kind of a, a, a fair reflection of the way that documentaries are actually financed in the UK, because mm-hmm. often TV's locked in. Right, so, t- so for all of you, sometimes TV's a done deal. Yeah, can I say one more thing yeah. about rights, because I think it's really different in the UK and in the US, mm-hmm. because in the US we have this really amazing educational distribution system, yeah. which is nowhere else in the world. Mm-hmm. It actually only exists in English-speaking countries. It was destroyed in England, actually, frankly, as much as I love Channel 4 and also the BBC, but it was destroyed by broadcasters showing these really great films and there being a tradition of professors taping them off the air and bringing them into the classroom. Yeah. So for the most part, they, there is there really isn't huge income for filmmakers from educational distribution. In other places in English-speaking countries like Australia and Canada, um, there is educational distribution, but there's not the numbers of people to really create that kind of income. In the U.S., however, there is an extraordinarily large educational audience. Our most successful film is a film that's made a half a million dollars just on educational sales alone. That's not TV, doesn't include any DVD, or just purely educational. So it is very different in in that way. And there is a big problem um, in terms of you do have to make a choice in terms of consumer or educational because you cannot have a film out widely in the consumer market for $19.95 or available for digital download and expect universities to pay $295 for a DVD. So it, it is really about deciding where is your best value you know, where are you going to be able to make the most money from? Um, and without a large, not large, but a really good kind of theatrical release and a nice, healthy broadcast, it's hard to make that money in consumer DVD. Because, you, you, you know, unless you're going to put that, and I would say more than one year, I would say it's really mm-hmm. two years that I mean filmmakers the real focus time. need to commit yeah. to really getting that film out. Mm-hmm. Um, and just going to say one other thing is that I don't think anybody can just, can, is as passionate about your film as you're going to be. You know, you are the person that spent all these years making the film. If you do want to do distribution, God bless you. You know, do it. I think it's a hell of a lot of hard work, and that's actually what we know how to do. Um, you are going to pay us for it, but that's what that's what we do. So, one thing it'll be interesting to see is as VOD supplants DVD, whether that remains sort of a uh, uh, in either or, you know, because 
yeah. if DVDs are going away, which I think they are eventually, right. then um, presumably you wouldn't have that same problem with No, DVD. you do, and I'll tell oh, you, you why. Yeah, because right now, no, 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 because right now we're in, in the process of building a digital delivery platform to universities where we're licensing at very high cost, again, because of the number of students that are able to have access to that one DVD. When you think about it, if you buy a DVD or if you download onto iTunes, you're going to see it, maybe you'll share it with five other people. When we sell, even, again, the rights or the license to an institution, thousands of people have access to it. Um, so we're really, again, if there was the volume to make up for, remember, you have to do 10 times the number of sales at, or 15 times the number of sales at $20 a pop to make up for the one sale at 300 you know, if there's the volume, then it's great, and we're, we're all for it. But for the kinds of films that we distribute, which have very, very particular kinds of markets, you know, we feel that educational is, is a better back end than the, than the consumer. Um, what we have found is that it is, and again, this goes back to the very traditional kind of windows, that later on, after we've kind of creamed the market in the educational market, we can put stuff out, like on, we have stuff out on iTunes now. It's not making huge amounts of money on iTunes because of that problem mm -hmm. of the marketing having been done kind of years before. And do you want to ramp up again and do a whole new re-release marketing campaign for something that's out on iTunes? It's difficult. And there's so many films out on iTunes that it's hard for people to even find it unless they have that name recognition. Yeah, you know? if, I, if I can just interject mm -hmm. there. I mean, for us, we're definitely adopting a model where we... I mean, theatrical releases, as we've all kind of discussed, they are the way to kind of get exposure for a film, uh, the, the traditional marketing. But more and more, we're, we're decreasing the window between theatrical and DVD and iTunes to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. So we released Restrepo on, in October last year. Uh, it played in the West End in, in Leicester Square in London for eight weeks, but and then immediately was on DVD and iTunes. Within three weeks of being on iTunes, it was the number one documentary of all time. Um, because that, that marketing just carried through. So right. it's all about re, uh, reducing the windows. And more and more, it's eight weeks at the moment, but we're looking to do day and date more and more. And uh, we're doing a film which is actually playing here at Sheffield called Page One, which I'd recommend you all to see. And it's all about digital versus print. So it's kind of the perfect film for us to explore on digital. And we're actually talking to iTunes at the moment about giving them an exclusive window before the theatrical release. So hmm. iTunes is actually... Um, yeah, it's doing great business for us. That's interesting. Well, is anybody it? else? I'm just curious, if you don't mind. Um, I'm really curious about, I think a lot of filmmakers are, but where is the money coming from? I mean, iTunes, yeah. <laughs> Who else is actually making money for filmmakers? Um, Digitally, you mean? Digitally. Yeah, I mean, in the UK, it's just iTunes and Love Film, which is a... And what? Love Film. Love Film? Which is a subscription VOD service. A so bit like Netflix. Like, like Netflix, Netflix in the States. okay, yeah. yeah. So with them, we would sell a kind of a package deal of a, a few titles for a flat fee. Um, but other than that, it's just iTunes. I mean, there were hundreds of platforms which kind of emerged over the last few years. And we tried a few of them, but we get checks for four pounds every year. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. How about you, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, there's Amazon, and there's Sony, PlayStation, and there's Xbox, and um, Netflix. But, well, Netflix is different because they're, they're actually, they're subscription, so that's, they pay a license fee. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, I think that all of these platforms, iTunes included, is, you know, right now in the experimentation phase, and, and sort of what it means for films right now kind of depends on whether you're as we said, one of the films that's also getting a theatrical release and lots of publicity and so that can, can carry over, um, or whether you're like a smaller, you know, film. And in that case, I think in some ways the, the relevance for digital platforms to those films right now is that because they're experimenting um, and because they're in the volume business to a large degree, those films are at, le at the very least getting that kind of distribution, which is more than sure. some films ever get. Yeah. So that it can be a good thing. Um, and it'll be interesting to see as these platforms become more established and actually do start generating more revenue, whether they still 
focus on the smaller films at all or whether those drop out. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that is generally what happens. You know, it's kind of like a bubble. I, I'm also kind of curious. I'm sorry, Bill Kreff. Go for it. <laughs> I'm used to moderating. Somebody sent me an email saying, oh, I see you're moderating a panel at Sheffield. <laughs> Go for it. Um, but I'm just curious, like, when I hear you talking about day and date, and, and you can, Jeff, you could certainly answer this for me. I think of Karen Cooper in the film forum. You know, the Film Forum in New York is like probably one of the best places, besides the IFC Center, <laughs> to open a film. And they've got a you know great mailing list. We love working with them because they really know how to market the kinds of films that, that we release. I think that Karen would have be apoplectic. She cares whether you show your <clears> film <throat> twice at the Film Society of Lincoln Center, you know, before she opens it theatrically. But that makes more sense you know, than caring I, about the digital stuff because it's the same audience, except maybe they live uptown versus downtown. But but doing a day and date, you think? Do you? I'm not challenging no, I you. Think I'm, that I'm, do you know Karen Cooper? Do you know what I'm talking about at the film bit. forum? So like, I just think that she would go crazy hearing about a day and date because she would really see it taking away from her theatrical audience. And you're right. There, are, a lot of theaters have still have a problem with that, and that's mm -hmm. an issue that we've faced. But our argument has always been, and I think has pretty much played out that the overlap is actually very small and that people, consumers are being divided into different categories in terms of how they prefer to watch movies. And sometimes it depends on what the movie is, you know, some films beg to be seen in theaters more than others. Like Cave of Forgotten Dreams, like which Forgotten is a Dreams. film that I would tell everybody, go out to the theater and see it. Don't mm -hmm. wait to see it any other way. That is the way that that, mm -hmm. that film was meant to be seen. Sure, but at the same time, there are just realities for certain people, whether it's, you know, whether it, even even for some people who would ideally love to go to the theater and, you know, have kids and have right. two jobs or, or whatever, or, or they live in a town that doesn't have an art house. But in, in New York, I think, even in New York, where there are lots of art houses, there are just different types of people that have different preferences. And we have found that we've done, we've had films that have done extremely well at the IFC Center and simultaneously well on VOD. So it's just, I mean, it's anecdotal. Ultimately, right. you'll never know, like, whether it could have been more in one. But the idea is that overall, the strategy works out better because of the way you can sort of get into the country in places that, that don't have art houses. I have had a, a distributor um, freak out on me because my film w was being broadcast close to the theatrical, shortly after the theatrical. It was actually, the theatrical went mm -hmm. long. So, you know, it was like we had, like, I think an eight-week theatrical run. Canada was scared sacred. And, and so the, the, the broadcast ran into it. And I got, he got on the phone. He was gonna, ready to pull the film from the theaters, even though it was doing well. Um, do you think that's still the case in terms of a broadcast window? How far apart does that have to be from the theatrical? HBO, we just sold a film to HBO. They won't let us do anything with the film before the broadcast. Like, So nothing. they want to hold it off, so you can't do the They want to hold it off because yeah. they want the publicity right. to all be around the broadcast. You know, mm -hmm. in the States at least, you know, you either get a review on the movie page or you get a review on the TV page. Um, mm -hmm. Now that there's the Internet, and this is one great mm -hmm. way that there's bloggers yeah. that are out there that don't care about that, and there's no more real estate. It's not as, as you know, it, it, because it's no longer paper. It's not a matter of how much space there is. In the Internet, there's, there's all kinds of space. But HBO is still kind of going back to that, uh, in some cases, that kind of, of situation. And they want to control everything up to and including the, the broadcast. So, How about you, um, I mean, we haven't had that situation, but more and more we're actually also using broadcast as a great launch pad for DVD and iTunes. So mm -hmm. um, Countdown to Zero, for instance, will be broadcast on Channel 4 on August the 16th. So we're going to release it on DVD and iTunes the day before, which means we get two weeks of free advertising on Channel 4 in the run-up to the film. And we've done this very successfully, especially with More 4, where we release day and date the DVD with their broadcast. And it, I mean, it does incredibly well for, for the DVD and for iTunes. I mean, we're living in an age when the consumer is king, so we need to let the consumer decide where, when, how they mm -hmm. see a film. And, and that, that's the whole point of collapsing windows and kind of getting it out there, because it doesn't... you would, the worry would be that you know, people just watch it on TV and then they won't buy the DVD or they won't go to iTunes, but actually the, the, the opposite is true. People will miss the TV or then they'll go out and buy it or they'll give it as a gift. And it's all about kind of getting the film out there in a very coordinated um, approach all, all at the same time for us.
And, and Jeff, what's your experience with that? And how does the broadcast window fit in to your um, theatrical releases? Typically, we the broadcast window happens um, later. It happens um, either it's usually even after the uh, the DVD release, or it's, I mean that sort of depends. But mm -hmm. Um, I mean, Cave of Forgotten Dreams is an interesting example because it was financed by the History Channel, and so we are occasionally willing to be flexible. It's a little bit harder for us because we are actually a television company. I mean, IFC is, you know, started as a channel and still is a channel, and so um, we have the ability to sell broadcast rights in a, in a really, you know, we're very well set up to do so. Um, so... You know, ideally we would we take those rights and and it would happen l uh, at a later window. But um, it it all depends on on how much we want the movie to be to be honest. You know, Cave of Forgotten Dreams has just crossed three million dollars at the box office and is showing no signs of stopping. So, you know, if if you think something can do that, it would be silly to turn away from it just because you can't get the broadcast. Right. Yeah. Great. Let's let's talk a little bit about mobile formats because that's new we, and upcoming. Uh, Do you I'm want to sorry. Add to that? Yeah, because yeah. I wanted to bring up something because I think it's so important. Filmmakers really need to think about this, especially given that um, the meat market is going on and and filmmakers are meeting with with broadcasters and other decision makers. You know, I think the biggest, one of the biggest issues facing filmmakers right now has to do with um, with convergence in terms of the way that brought what kinds of rights. I alluded to this before. What kinds of rights? broadcasters are asking for. Mm -hmm. um, and there are broadcasters that are asking for all digital rights because what they see is that you know, broadcast will no longer be on a television versus a computer. Mm -hmm. But what happens when they take all those rights is that those are actually the old DVD rights that you used to be able to sell. Because if the delivery system is the computer, that's digital delivery. So mm -hmm. this is a, a and in fact, there's, there is actually, I believe, that the um, ITVS contract for international producers um, asks for all digital rights. And we're seeing this more and more. And mm -hmm. you know, we used to be able to negotiate with broadcasters for like VOD for two weeks post-broadcast. Um, they're expanding it, you know, every single time that, w that we see a new broadcast deal. So it's just something to really, really watch out for. And what, what's, what's the, is there a solution? Do we need to um, organize to try to make it not happen? I, I think so. Personally, mm -hmm. I think so. I think that filmmakers, uh, that their revenue base is being chipped away mm -hmm. by, this, by this collapsing, not the collapsing of, of windows, but the collapsing of delivery systems. Um, yeah, I mean, in the UK, if, if you do sell your film to BBC or Channel 4, they will ask for the internet rights, but... You can often negotiate to keep iTunes. I mean, it, it's often case by case, but mm -hmm. every time we've asked BBC or Channel 4, can we put it on iTunes, they have been amenable. So it is, a, it is an issue to be aware of, but in the UK at least, they are, they are slightly more open to negotiation. So, I, so again, I have a question. So everything on BBC, it seems like, goes on to iPlayer. iPlayer, yeah. So if you are theatrically releasing a film that the BBC funded... You're also, it's, it's non-exclusive. The digital yeah. is non-exclusive. Yeah. So it's available for free on iPlayer, yeah. but people can also download it for money yeah. from iTunes. Yeah. And that doesn't impact your, your income? Um, it, it obviously does carve into it, but um, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know the exact figures. But. Yeah, just, just so that you know, like when... Um, you know, we work with... One of the other things about digital rights is that, you know, there's, there's a lot of people carving taking pieces of that money. And the amount of money that filmmakers get eventually is is very small because you've got um, the aggregate, you've got iTunes that's taking a piece, then you have an aggregator because iTunes will only work with designated uh, aggregators that can only work with designated labs because what they require in terms of their digital files is very, very, very high quality. Um, then the distributor that sold it to the aggregator and takes a piece, and then the filmmaker gets their piece. So it's that's not that different from you know any other platform necessarily. Well, the aggregator is new, right? 
Yeah, I guess it just it and depends iTunes, on and iTunes and and the fact that that iTunes is taking a piece of it, which they're now increasing to thirty percent for take forty percent. Yeah. Income. Well, but the theaters take hmm. percentages, and cable operators take percentages, and the different. The question is whether the distributor is also an aggregator, and the, if there if there's an added step of an aggregator, I can. I yeah. See your point. So that that's yeah. when when there is that that added step. But I actually say sorry. Um, I forgot my train of thought. Anyway, that's that's good information right there. So IFC is an aggregator as well. Yeah, so you have a movie theater, you've got a channel, and you've got you've we got deal it all directly there. with iTunes. Uh -huh. So there wouldn't be that added step. But uh -huh. it's true. I mean, iTunes takes a cut just the way that a theater would, or mm -hmm. um, you know, a DVD distributor would. And and how many of you actually do VOD directly from your own platforms? Do do any of you do that? Streaming on That's what this digital delivery platform that we're creating. You're, so you're going to create doing it with to cut out the middle person. We're doing it with three other distributors uh, mm -hmm. in the U.S., um, Bullfrog Films, Icarus Films, and uh, California Newsreel. Uh -huh. So the four of us are, are designing it, actually working, we're not designing it, but we're working with a, a vendor to design it, and we'll be able to digitally deliver to both universities and to, and to individuals. Mm -hmm. um, but individual will probably be, will launch that after we launch the institutional. Yeah, and, and we're looking to, to launch our own, again, on Goodwood Film, which is kind of this hub for the community. And it, it will start off being our films, but we're looking to make it a white label further down the line so that other uh, similar genre documentaries can, can sit on that platform as well. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Jeff? Are you planning we to We actually, we have launched our own um, digital store called Sundance Now. Um, and all, most of our films are available for transactional VOD there. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. And, and let's, um, we're going to get to questions in, in just a few minutes, but uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the mobile platform now. That's, that's new and up and coming. And, um, have any of you had any experience with that, and do you think that's going to take off with either the iPhone or the i, you know, the m smartphone or the uh, iPad, those those kind of specialized formats, small formats? How relevant is I'll that? I'll just say that, that we haven't done anything with mobile. I I would love to actually, uh -huh. <laughs> but in a different way than perhaps you're thinking. I, um, I will also say that all the films that I'm looking at for acquisition right now are on my iPad. I think mm -hmm. iPads are fantastic mm -hmm. as a way of looking at films. Um, and I think that we should definitely be, you know, I don't, I, well, I think iPad, computer, there's no difference except for, mm -hmm. there's no difference. Um, but I just want to throw out there that one of the things that, that I think in terms of mobile phones and also for all the things that we're talking about that filmmakers should be thinking about is versioning. Mm -hmm. um, I think versioning is the answer to our conundrum of, you know, consumer versus educational. I think it's the answer to so many different things. And what I'm talking about is creating 20-minute versions that are appropriate for some audiences, keeping a feature version for other audiences, making an hour-long version for television. I'm talking about having them be different names but being marketed mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, and having five-minute or 30-second 30, 30 versions for mobile phones and using them as, uh, as promotional tools. Why not? I mean. Mm -hmm. I tell this to filmmakers all the time, and so few of them do it. Right now, we've got one filmmaker who's, I think, really smart. They created a DVD. Um, it's an educational film. It was not in, I think, any festivals whatsoever. Um, no theatrical, of course. It's about uh, domestic violence, and they created a DVD with all of these other extra bonus materials that are really for educational use. You know, pulled out a section from the film, used outtakes, created another section, one is on family court system, another is on order of protection, which is a very particular legal, you know, just all kinds of sections. And now they've got a, a five-minute section, which is going to start being sold for transactional VOD on a website. I can't remember what website. And it's, it, we're really using it as a promotion to sell the full DVD. Um, it's, it's great. It's fantastic. Why not? You've got all these assets there, particularly with your, with your outtakes. I can't believe that filmmakers don't do more with them. I just told a filmmaker today, you're telling me that this is a side story that you're not going to have in the film. Make me a 25-minute film. I can sell it educationally. It won't have anything to do with your theatrical, anything to do with your edu uh, with your television broadcast, and it's an extra income stream for you. Jeff, some thoughts on the mobile apps? 
I mean, I guess I agree with Debbie that uh, there's really it's just an extension of the computer, um, you know. It's and it's a it's a consumer preference. Personally, I would probably never watch a movie on my phone. I think that's where I draw the line. iPad, I can deal with. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but you know, some people obviously watch movies that way, and and I think as a distributor, you have to you have to be available wherever people want to watch movies. Um, yeah, pretty much the same. I mean, the launch of the iPad was, was really interesting in the UK because there was a, a, a massive spike in the amount of transactions on iTunes for movies. So, I mean, the iPad has been a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, in terms of mobile phones, I agree. I don't think I would do it. So, I, for me, it's more a promotional, maybe serialization of a film mm -hmm. or versioning, as Deborah says. But um, it's more promotional, I would have thought. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so before we get to questions, how about we just go down through each of you, and if you just want to just reflect uh, uh, sort of a closing comment on, on what we've talked about, and um, Deborah, if you want to start. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, I love page one. It's a great film, and I'll be really curious to see what you do with, with iTunes in terms of um, experiment. I love experimenting. I mean, I guess that's, that's my final thought, is that I think that we all have to be really creative. Um, I think that um, we're in a, a particular situation because we acquire the films that nobody else wants, the ones that are really difficult and challenging. And although most of them have a social issue content, we also distribute really challenging films um, in terms of form and in terms of experimentation with the form of cinema. Um, so we have to be really creative in what we're doing, and I think that filmmakers need to, to be creative. I also think that... that what both of you, I think, are talking about, and particularly with Cave, is that we're, we're really talking about the theater becoming a place of an event, and that that's a really wonderful way of thinking about it. I was at um, the Sunshine Cinema, which is another art house cinema in New York, and saw something I'd never seen before, which was the theater manager come out into the front of a commercial art house cinema and say, just want to let you know what we've got coming up, and you know we're going to be premiering Tree of Life by Terrence Malick, which was before it actually got the award at Cannes, you know, actually promoing what was coming to the theater because theaters actually are having a lot of trouble getting people into the door. And I personally, when I hear that a film is going to be on TV, will wait until it's on TV and not go out to the theater. But if we think about theaters as places of events and create events around it, working collaboratively, um, it's, I think we need that to create that kind of buzz that we all need to see the film through its through all of those markets. Yeah, I mean, I guess, um, I think that in, t in terms of the relevance of new digital platforms to documentary filmmakers, independent filmmakers, um, I think it's useful to, you know, from to think about these things as less about sort of as game changers and more as things that are essentially replacing, you know, older forms, whether it's DVD or um, theatrical, although, in, yeah, as Debbie says, I think theatrical, to a certain extent, never goes away. It's just which films are, are being distributed theatrically. Um, but, you know, the new digital platforms are essentially replacing DVD, um, and, they allow, and as long as there is some sort of ancillary platform that allows distributors to exist so that you know they can they can because as Debbie says recoup their costs you know recoup <laughs> our costs which doesn't tend to happen with theatrical then you know then then they should be celebrated but in terms of uh, as filmmakers you know the same rules apply you know make films that are either going to be driven by um, reviews or by some grassroots um, element that that can be marketed or or have or you have to have some sort of built in name brand cast member or director or something. All of these things still have to happen in order to be successful on, on digital platforms. So still have to make um, movies that are either good or commercial or both. <laughs> right. Um, and yeah for me, I mean the overriding thinking behind everything we do is that we, we do live in the age when the consumer is king. There's so many films out there. Um, 
what filmmakers need to do is identify their audience from the very beginning, um, and they can bring that expertise to the distribution. But us as distributors, we need to work with that expertise, but then also just let the consumer decide when they want to see a film, how they want to see a film. So look at non-theatrical screenings, look at um, creative, different ways of getting your film out there, collapse the windows, get it out. I mean, you only get one shot at publicity often, so make the most of it, and um, the consumers will come to you. Wonderful. Thank you all. That was, that was great. Um, let's throw it open to questions. Does anyone have a question for any or all of our panelists? Go ahead. Yes. And if you could say your name, and a mic is coming right to you. Hi, my name's Ann Rose. <laughs> um, having just fled a cable network and <laughs> had to negotiate with filmmakers about getting all rights um, and defend that position, I'm interested in distributors being able to, you know, ind indie distributors being able to you know, have, having the available technology now to be able to distribute digitally and have the freedom to do that and not have to then sell off those rights yourself because then it gives you potential for more revenue and puts the film, I think, in a better position. Uh, they don't completely understand how it works. So maybe, you know, Debbie, you talked about partnering with a couple of different uh, companies or organizations to do your own VOD distribution. I'd be curious to hear a little more about that. Well, basically, I mean, we're personally not going to do it, but um, it's basically just about being able to um, to stream uh, and to charge people for the streaming. It's really nothing, there's nothing complicated actually about it. Um, any filmmaker can do it on their own website, um, just like any filmmaker. And we allow our filmmakers, by the way, to uh, sell DVDs off their own websites. Mm -hmm. um, what we do is we ask them, it's a collaborative relationship. We ask them to link to us for, for institutional sales um, and to be cognizant that they should be selling to people that are buying it for individual use. And that's where the, your question about how does it the bleed through, um, it does get tricky. Um, although I think that, and that's something that we have to really think about, um, although I think IP addresses might be very helpful in that circumstance, um, just like, just like Email addresses are really helpful. When somebody sends us an email from an edu, .edu, we know it's for university use. Um, the way that we're going to start doing it, though, is not so much with transactional VOD, but it's with allowing institutions, and this is a slightly complicated because the stumbling block has to do with authentication. Universities don't want to have to give their students another password, so it needs to be integrated seamlessly with their authentication system. Um, what universities, by the way, are doing, which you just might be interested in, is they still want the DVD, but they're buying a license from us for the digital file. And sometimes they're digitizing it themselves. Mm -hmm. So we'll sell them a DVD, they digitize it, um, they pay us for a license. The other kind of big issue right now has to do with whether the license, and here's another thing for filmmakers to be thinking about. You know, un we're fighting with universities because they want the license in perpetuity. Um, some of my colleagues want to sell it for one year, three year, and that's what we're doing right now, one year, three year, and five year licenses. I personally don't believe that we get that much repeat business that I care about going back to the university and getting another five years after the first five years are up. Um, but the bigger problem is we can't really sell in perpetuity because you guys haven't cleared the rights in perpetuity. And this is going to come up more and more and more. You mean uh, release release forms? I'm talking individuals no. Or, I'm talking about the archival footage that you use in your footage, film, yeah. the photos that you use in the uh -huh. film, the music rights that you clear in your film. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to sell you rights in perpetuity. So how can we sell the rights in perpetuity? So our most recent thought or hedge against that is that we license for the life of the format. Um, I don't know if this is answering your question at all, Anne, but it just made me think about these things because I think it is important, again, for filmmakers to understand. So we sell the life of the format because, by the way, you know, besides Blu-ray, there's going to be all kinds of different digital formats. Right now we're working with certain kinds of digital files, but those files are going to change, and the delivery of those files may change dramatically as well. So... Yeah, I guess I was yeah. just curious, like, how, you know, how digital distribution can allow for like the most possible, the, the, the biggest possible audience and, the, and directed audience and the biggest, the most possible revenue for a film so that you're not just like dividing out the rights all over the place and, you know, diversifying to the point of dissipation or, you know, so. I don't know. 
Well, the, mm -hmm. the advantage of starting your own is that you cut out the middleman. The disadvantage is that you're starting your own thing that no one knows <laughs> <It's> about. <laughs> so that's why I think, I think ideally, probably anyone who's starting something like that would like it to be exclusive one day, but you can't afford to do that when no one knows what it is. Um, so I think that that's sort of the struggle. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no. uh, I've got actually two questions. Uh, first question relates to the question before. Um, basically, when you want to um, broadcast on VOD on your own website, for example, how, how do you ensure that um, the digitized version is actually secured and privacy won't happen? The second question is actually for Doc Wolf. In the ambassador program, how much resources you give, do you give the ambassador for uh, venue costs, print costs, ensuring uh, the web stream is secured, um, and whether or not social marketing um, is more beneficial than theatrical release in terms of marketing costs? So uh, that's the questions. Great. All do you want to take that on? Um, in terms of the support for ambassadors, um, I mean, we don't offer any financial contribution to their venue costs or their operational costs. Um, I mean, the whole program is really to encourage slightly more entrepreneurial people in their areas who, who are kind of ready to put on events and to kind of make money. Um, what we're offering is national PR, national marketing, which they wouldn't get otherwise. We, we send them kind of print promotional materials, so posters, etc. Um, we offer them exclusive access to an ambassador's area on the, on the website where they can share knowledge and advice with other ambassadors. So it's a real community offering each other advice. And we're offering them money. The more tickets they sell, the more money they get to keep. So um, that's what we offer them. So it's really like micro cinemas. Yeah. It's basically an alternative complementary exhibition circuit. It's basically cinemas where there are no cinemas. Um, and they're becoming cinema owners, managers, but just not in cinema venues. Um, yeah. And Jeff, you probably know the answer to the um, protecting the live yeah. streaming. Oh, I didn't know that. Right. Uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't know the technical details. I know that we have the ability to, for example, geofilter based on which territories we own. Um, I, I don't know the actual technical details of how that's done. But I know that there are precautions that are taken. And, but I also think that to a certain degree, you know, there's no 100% protection against piracy. And on the independent film level, to, to a certain degree, I think piracy can be a good sign <laughs> because it means people want to see the movies. Right. I remember my nephew finally thought I was cool when he realized he could get my uh, film on BitTorrent. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. You're actually pirated? Well, by that's the cool. way, all you need to do is have your film on the BBC for it to be available on BitTorrent. <laughs> Everything that's, at, that's on the BBC right. can be torrented. Yeah. Oh. yeah just, uh, just another, another question. Yeah, your turn. Yeah. Go ahead. <clears throat> oh, I thought it was her turn. Yeah, right. Good. Um, so uh, you did mention this, but I wanted to go back to it um, because there's so often a gap between the time the filmmaker makes a broadcast deal mm -hmm. and between the time that you get a distributor on board. If you had a wish list, you know, what would you tell the filmmaker, please reserve or at least negotiate to retain X rights? What would you say we should be trying to hold on to? So you've said iTunes, which I would have actually thought they would never give that up, but now you're saying... They might, if you ask. So what else should we be asking? Well, well first of all, it depends on, and how much you're going to get depends on how much money they're putting into the film. And yeah. part of the problem is broadcasters will put in a very small percentage of the budget and be asking for everything. Um, it also depends on whether it's a pre-sale and whether it's a co-production. Co um, you should ask for everything. What they should get, I think, is the right to broadcast it a certain amount of times over... Um, you know, a certain amount of releases, and a release means one week. Um, they can show it as many times as they want during that week, a very specific number of releases over a specific number of years. That's what I would ask for. You're not going to get that anymore. <laughs> Anne is smiling, having just come from the Sundance Channel. <laughs> um, then the next level is VOD for a couple of weeks. I think POV now has a one-month window on uh, VOD free streaming. 
um, after the uh, after the broadcast, and we go along with that, and and actually find that this is part of kind of the it's it's promotional. It's fine. I mean, it's good. It's it's okay. We don't we don't really mind it. Um, that's as far as I would go, and I, and I would have it all clarified, you know, very specifically. And what I say to broadcasters, and here's a good thing to say, is that if they bought your film, if there was no such thing as computers and internet distribution, and there were only TVs, could they show your film 24-7 on a channel for seven years, right? That's what they're asking when they ask to have all the digital rights, is the ability to stream it for free, 24-7, on a channel. That's it. So why, why should you do that? Anyone else want to respond to that? What, what's your wish list? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, you want to retain the internet rights. It might have to be non-exclusive. And then I just think one other thing is a hold back so that you do get the opportunity to maybe try a theatrical release. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so right. it, it's good to clarify when the license period starts mm -hmm. and ask for a hold back from, from the date of delivery of the film. So that it, it might happen, it might not, but at least you get a shot at doing a theatrical release. Right. And... Besides theatrical, if you're very serious about getting a theatrical release and you think that your film has a chance for an Academy Award, ask, put in a, a clause for Academy holdback. So, for example, with Kim's films, uh, Channel 4 has been really fantastic about holding back the broadcast uh, in England so that we can get the broadcast, so that we can be eligible in the U.S. and get the theatrical screenings going in the U.S. Um, we've been disqualified uh, for going for Academy consideration because of broadcasts in European countries, which don't affect, of course, U.S. distribution at all, but affect the Academy. And even a nomination would be wonderful. So That's it's right. really, really to everyone's benefit. This is what I don't understand when broadcasters refuse that. It's absolutely to their benefit to have a film that has a nomination or even a win. So I would, I would definitely make that argument. Can I, I was going to say one thing with my cable TV broadcaster hat on. Um, they're very happy when the filmmaker comes and says, you know, I want these rights, but, you know, I'm willing and able and will put it in a contract to participate, coordinate um, publicity and all aspects of the distribution rollout. Because I think the big issue with cable is, you know, the reason you're doing these docs a lot of times is for yes. review. And if you That's don't get right. the TV review, you get the theatrical review. And generally the cable network's never mentioned in that. So, mm -hmm. you know, we were doing deals at the end of when Sundance was still doing docs where, you know, if we can make sure that we're participating in every aspect of the rollout in terms of PR and attention, we're much happier to kind of give away those windows. So I'm not, I can't speak for every broadcast, but I feel like if you bring that up into the conversation, you know, it becomes a negotiation, really. Right. It exactly. seems like it's about having really good synergy between all the players and the windows and making it work together instead of being in competition.